Yeah. What a climax. It's just us. Holy shit. Yeah. Hey, listen, we've got Nature's Trip in the background joining us tonight. Yeah. Hey, look, it's always good to get uh, pictures of uh, Nature's Trip on. We're having a few technical difficulties out here, Ben. Yeah, uh, we've just got to get uh, Steve to download the right browser, not compatible with our streaming software. Massive oversight on our part. Mate, uh, just a question for the people who are joining us early on. Someone named the jockey aboard Nature's Trip there. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there is a BGP hoodie to the first person that can get that correct answer through in the comments. Oh, that's horny. I think yeah, I know ben, who it is. Ben will organise that for you. So <laughs> yeah, 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 sweet. <laughs> Send an email to the movement. The boys get paid. Dot com. We'll sort of in the morning. Hopefully, still will be soon. Obviously, we were just tuning into one at Newcastle. By the sounds, Ben. Yeah, the goat tipped us into something. Uh, I believe it was a two-year-old. Um... Uh, jockey Rob Thompson, two-year-old, was four twenty into two dollars ninety. Bunker reckons it wasn't a goat, but it certainly came from his Facebook account. Bunk, so you know that we'll just run with that for now. But a controversy behind the scenes. Yeah, okay, okay. But uh, oh. run second, fell. It was set in the rail, weaved through, got to the lead, swamped last uh, last fifty. Look at that. The people say J Mac, J Mac. So obviously, I don't know what was... is J Mac to be honest. They, they owe you a hoodie by the looks, Ben. They didn't look like J Mac. Many they, hoodies. That very, that very photo. Uh, it's a bit of a shit. Like, yeah, okay. Maybe we should tell people they need to download Chrome just to, to be live from. Hopefully, everyone's doing well out there and is going to join us on Saturday, 3 p.m., for a few beers, bets, and brainstorm. We hear we might have a few of the industry leaders joining us. We'll probably put them on mute because that's what they've been doing themselves for the last four weeks. <laughs> Ah! Oh, not there. Oh, my golly gosh. <laughs> no, that's a bit unfair. Well, it's probably not. I mean, you can't over communicate in a time like this, and I would say that uh, to any of their faces, and we'll do that on Saturday via the stream if need be, too. But now it should be good. We'll spit more some ideas for BGP and for racing in general. So feel free to bring uh, any ideas to the table. We'd love to hear, and hopefully, we can back a couple of winners on Saturday, too. I haven't had a look at the fields yet, but uh, there's still plenty of time. Yeah, listen, this is going to be controversial. We've got a couple of comments uh, for the to win the hoodie, who the Nature Strip jockey is, and I'm actually not that sure myself. Um, it's either, it's one of the two. It's either Damian Lane or Ryan Maloney. Uh, um, I think Huge Chapman was first in with Ryan Maloney, so I think okay. it's Ryan Maloney. I'm just trying to pick the track. Is it Sandown? Yeah, I can't remember when that race was. But it definitely wasn't a trader, so no, it wasn't a trader. Uh, he probably slept in that day. I think it's Sandown's got the Labrokes fucking riding all over it, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, anyway. Louis, Louis in the background off the stream team, for those that are watching, just trying to – here he is, trying to get Steve on. Uh, yeah. He's hard at work here. Yeah. <laughs> he's hard at work. He's, he's got to get up. The, you got to get aggressive. Thank you, Louis. Oh, gee, it's good to have a little apprentice. Um, yeah, what have you been up to this week, mate? You uh, Did you make a, Did you back to Fane on the weekend? No, nah, back Pirato. Huge fucking idiot. What about the Quinella? What place, you dumb motherfucker. It was a great oh, place, bun. Smart, very smart. What? Well, how about the Quinella? What did that pay, mate? Talk to me. Uh, I think Talk, it was thirty nines. Talk dirty to me. Thirty nines. Jesus, how much you have of that? Fifty. Uh, I had a hundred. Well, I tried to have a hundred on, and I uh, went back to see what I'd won, and I thought, oh, there should be more money in my account than that. But uh, I'd actually ticked an extra horse. That I'd never even heard of white mist or white moss or some shit. Um, and I'm like, what the? Oh, fuck? that thing led them up in the yeah, carry on. Sorry, mate. Yeah, so I only got 50 of it rather than a hundy, but still 50 at 39s. It was still a good collect, plus the each way bets that I had on, especially on the Tuesday at 14. dollars I'll have you know, yeah, that's fucking fantastic. Sorry, mate, I'm just in the background here trying to find out who this fucking jockey is. <laughs> Yeah, good, mate, good. It's very solid. Maybe we could do some facial recognition software. It was actually when I, I did the post in uh, the Facebook group, so uh, if you look back. Is there Simon? Posted, Simon Philippe's, is it? Oh, oh, Simon Philippe's, is it? Oh, yeah. the one and only. Hey, Louis. I, I mean, oh, yeah, Louis on, he reckons? Yeah. Okay, 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 talk to us, Louis. Is uh, Steve showing up there, Let's. No. Nah. Okay. Okay, um, interesting. Right, we might need a bit of a plan B then. Uh, we might need to crack a Zoom Zoom stream up if that's not all right. Let me let me go back. Oh, give give me one more give me one more minute. Yeah. 
Because <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, your phone, you can't do stream yet on your phone, can you? Here is it. He's here. He's here. We've got him. Oh, you got him. We got. Oh, it looks like we got you. There we go. Here he is. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! All right, enjoy, boys. <laughs> See you, Benny. You're all right. How are you going? Good, mate. It, Good to have you. It, Steve, apologies for that. That was uh, look. That's some. That's some poor organisation for us. Like if we were, if we were a rugby player right now, and we turned up to training after that sort of piss poor preparation. Um, I'm sure you'd be I don't know, putting. I don't know what you'd do, but I feel bad. So, to thank you for bearing with us, mate. Appreciate it. No problem. Now, listen. Uh, why don't I try and get some iPods on here too, eh? Yeah, you won't be able to hear me very well, can you? No, actually, the, it sounds bloody good. If up to you, if you want to get some iPod uh, earpods in, but look, it's coming through pretty crisp. Okay. Well, we'll just get on with it, eh? <laughs> it sounds like right. it. That's, it's a great attitude. Hey, hey, look, for everybody that's been waiting, waiting patiently, we've got to say thanks to them too. Um, boys get paid again. We, we've spoken to Brenda McCullum during lockdown, then Chris Waller, and we thought, how do we back that up? That we've gone for another, well, a coach of sorts, because Chris Waller's a bit of a coach, isn't he, Steve? And I know you've got a bit of admiration or mutual admiration there with Chris. Well, he's definitely a coach, there's no doubt about that, and I've definitely got a lot of admiration for him. He's, uh, he's a wizard. Well, that's one way to put it. Um, mate, the last time we caught up, you probably don't remember, I struggled too as well, but it was actually 2011 on the train back from Flemington. Jimmy Shewer oh, yeah. Shew had just been beaten in the Emirates. Uh, we had a fairly decent bet on the place that day, and we all seemed a little bit sombre on the train. I just wanted to find out from the man himself, did you back Jimmy Shewer that day as well? Uh, I did, actually. I did. Mm. I thought so. Yeah. I thought so. Oh, um, we'll get... Been shopping all week, so you had to go for a Jimmy Shewer, didn't you? Yeah, try and, try, and pay for some of the, try and pay for some of it. Yeah. But, hey, Steve, give us some context about what you're doing at the moment. You've had some outstanding assistance getting the stream up and going, not from us, obviously, but from other people at home. So you're in New Zealand. Um, the whole COVID-19 mm. situation is kind of it's throwing a bit of a spanner into the works, isn't it? Yeah, well, we're in, obviously, lockdown with um, with a bubble of four, my wife and two of our daughters. Um, they're both back from Otago University, so uh, they're wizards on the computer, which is quite handy. Yeah. Haven't been doing too much else, really. We've just been a bit of study, and we've just moved into this house, so um, we've sort of been getting it ready to, to live in, really, so it's been quite handy. Fantastic. Well, look, let's not waste too much more time. A lot of people are very curious, including us, um, and this is what I've been asking everybody, really, where your initial, I guess, introduction to racing came, because a lot of people will be watching this and going, oh, that's that bloke from the rugby team. Um, but you, you've got a very keen interest in racing, as we see behind you. You've got a lovely uh, little montage of pictures up there. And So yeah. so where, where did that come from? Is it a family thing, or, or how, how did you get involved in this great sport? Yeah, it was a family thing. Dad uh, was a real keen uh, horseman. He we had a dairy farm down south, and he spent a lot of his um, younger years uh, helping uh, trainers like um, Hick Anderson Senior and Arthur Didham, and uh, he, had, he was great mates with a uh, jockey by the way, uh, name of uh, Bob Skelton. And um, yeah, we'd go to the races pretty regularly and then dad took up a, his own owner trainer's license uh, at one stage there so um needed someone to ride the horses and I, at that stage i was small enough <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds like your uh, dad's been a little bit of a mentor to you in sorts well yeah in a number of ways yeah and you know, his father should be i guess but uh you know, he's a good man yeah 100%. was there uh, the uh, uh, sorry you go look no, I was just going to say 100% can relate, as I'm sure a number of the audience can as well. Was mm. there ever a, um, a thought that you would take up racing or kind of move into the racing industry as a career path? Like I know a lot of people that grow up in those environments, um, it's quite a natural progression or you're around it so much, it just feels kind of natural. Did Was there ever any inclination to get involved on that level? Uh, yeah, there was actually. There was a lot. Uh, when I was smaller, I wanted to be a jockey. Um, outgrew that but uh i did think at one stage i'd look at um maybe ha having a crack at training um and i would have gone offshore to do that i think you know 
got some um, skills uh, from overseas and then maybe come back. But uh, rugby got um, underway and then I got that heavily involved in that. That really didn't have time to, to do that. What do you see the big difference is from when you first got into racing as a younger fella to, to now in terms of how it's woven into into people's lives in New Zealand here? Um, I, look, I think New Zealand racing itself has is, is, uh, gone backwards. You know, I think uh, if you go back in time, uh, stakes were probably better back then, you know, 20, 30 years ago than they are now. Um, there's the odd, you know, big meeting uh, where things are, are pretty good, but by and large, like, yeah, costs have gone up and, and uh, the stake money's gone down. So uh, it's pretty disappointing. We're still breeding um, some great racehorses and athletes, who I like to call uh, horses athletes. And, um, you know, I think we're one of the best breeding countries in the world and we probably need our government uh, to step up and actually pour some dough into something that's actually creating a, a great... Uh, a great industry um, and, and, you know, helping New Zealand be put on the map. So it'd be good to see you know, some of the stake money go up. It's it's funny you say that because Chris Waller last week, I mean, he had very similar thoughts about, um, I guess, central government support and needing to do their part to let, you know, even active industry participants just like us, whether we're having a punt or you breeding or owning, you know, we all want to pull our weight, but we need the government to kind of do a bit. Does it does it concern you that um, racing people let this happen to the industry? Was there enough foresight when times got tough? Look, I don't think it's racing people that let it happen. I think it's a combination of things that have let it happen. And, um, you know, if you, if you look at Australian racing, which I reckon is a great model, particularly Victoria and New South Wales and maybe to a lesser extent um, Brisbane, uh, you know, the governments have played a big part, but they don't just play a big part in in racing. They play a big part in just about all the sports. And, uh, you know, it, New Zealand government's making a lot of money out of um, tax payments from, from the industry and the TAB in itself. So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a need of government assistance and, you know, maybe they just haven't uh, approached it the right way in asking them, but you know, rock up and, and have a sit down. Like Winston's tried to do it a couple of times, but not a lot's happened. And you know, the first time all the money went on two or three races, and you know that's not the way you want to do it. Oh yeah, we'll we'll add it to the to-do list, mate. Uh, on to more uh, exciting well, things. You boys have you know you've taken on a big step, so you may as well go the whole hog. There's no point in going halfway. Yeah, someone's just said the stampede to Parliament is coming, so we better put the bloody boots on and start getting down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mate, talk, talk us through the journey with Nature Strip. Well, it's been pretty easy, really. Um, got a phone call, asked if I wanted to go in the horse. Paddy Harrison uh, is a good mate of mine. He from Harrison's up it, so he's a good plug for him. Um, he... He asked me, and Peter King is also a member and, and uh, a good mate, so uh, took up the option. Was, first of all, it was with a horse called um, The Answer, My Friend, and uh, and then the Nature Strip came up, and um, Smurden suggested to Paddy that, look, you need to take a share in this horse. He's pretty, he's a pretty good horse at this and hadn't had a race at that point. So um, Paddy passed that info on to me, and I said, okay, I'm in. And the rest is, you know, history. He's, uh, he's just been a pleasure to be part of. Is is he the best horse you've been involved with so far, Steve? Oh, yeah, 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 no, without a doubt. You know, he's he's probably the best sprinter in the world at the moment. So, um, yeah, we've had some good horses, but not. No, he's a great horse. Talk us through that a little bit. What's your portfolio looked like and kind of what, what have you – so, you know, we know you've got a keen interest in the industry and you have for a long time, but uh, breeding, owning, so what kind of – how did that progression start? Um, we'll start off with Dad again and um, Mum and Dad and myself. We, um, we had a horse called Diaga and another one called Tory Bell. Uh, both handy mares themselves and uh, so when time came – 
And Diaga, I think she won seven and run second seven times. She was quite a good good mare. Uh, so we bred from her and um, and then bred from one of the daughters called Sparkling All Over. Uh, that's how we got Dizzy's dream. Um, but I came to the conclusion after a wee while that um, you know, you, you're pouring a lot of money into a, a big sieve and not getting a lot back in New Zealand racing. So we, I've now sort of put most of my um, racing money goes to Australia to support uh, you know the syndicates over there. And you've only got to win one race and your whole year's racing has been paid for. You know, and uh, for an owner, uh, or I guess everybody that operates in the racing industry back here, um, you know, you've got to win a lot of races before you even pay for your costs. So we still have one brood mare back here um, by the name of Elusive Catch. Um, we sent her to Australia. She went over in Australia as well. A couple of my mates, Sabin Kirkland and uh, Grant McKenzie, uh, shareholders in that, and, and uh, we've sold one foal out of her. And she's got a lovely colt at foot by Farage at the moment um, down there in Invercargill. So those, those boys are looking after her down there, and we'll probably race that uh, with the idea of getting him ready and then probably send him to Australia you know, to race over there. And I've got a, a um, filly by the name of, well, she's not a filly now, she'll be a uh, mere mum's jewel, uh, Scott Gibbs. Chris Gibbs trains, uh, tra trains her up um, at, uh, up north and at least her out to them. So now that's all the interests I've got, really, plus uh, about four or five other young horses that haven't got names yet in Australia. I can recall Mum's still running around at Royal Carker, I think. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. She's won four now, so she's just, she's just getting better and better with age. I think she's t rising uh, five-year-old, so I think that's when we'll see the best out of her. Oh, mate, we're going to get our money's worth today. Um, speaking of um, people, being in the background here, we, we can't see him. He's got himself off off uh, screen, but he's definitely listening. But there he is. I, <laughs> any... I, I struggle with him a bit, mate. Like he has his on days and he has his off days. I wanted to ask you, how do you get the best out of people? Uh, well, accepting that they're going to have off days, um, that's the first thing because we all do. Um, yeah, the big thing is recognising, you know, that, that that happens, but also getting them to buy into the fact, well, okay, if you're having an off day, just give us 100% of what you got. It might only be 90 of what you're capable of, but at least if we get 100% of that 90, um, yeah, you're still going to get a decent uh, performance out of Benny Boy. Just to carry on from that, I think at the moment, um, <laughs> at the moment, it's, the Michael Jordan documentary seems to be pretty popular and captivating people. And he's a real 1% type human, right? And you would have coached a number of players and athletes like that. Is it hard to balance some of those people that are just absolutely obsessed with what they do versus the ones that just have talent um, and just want to do it but aren't quite at that obsessed level? Well, that, that's the thing about Michael Jordan, isn't it? He Not only did he have talent, and he had X-factor talent too. It wasn't just that he was good. He, he had X-factor talent. He's coupled that with the mental fortitude um, that you, know, you want and need to be a great athlete, uh, and then he's coupled that with a real passion and desire um, to want to win and you know, to be the best. And when you, when you have X-factor, a work ethic that comes from wanting – desperately to be the best player you can be, um, you, know, you, you get what you get in Michael Jordan. You know, he's a super, superlative athlete. He can do things other people can't do. He's pushed the boundaries and, and shown people that they can actually do things differently too. And I watched the documentary, funnily enough, the other night, and you know, when uh, they lost Scotty Pittman, you, you could see him stepping up to the plate and pushing others to to work harder and give another 5% uh, of what they had. And you can't replace someone like Scotty Pittman, but, you know, everyone else, if they work 5% harder, uh, you know, you can still get the job done. Beautiful. Uh, look, I, I know that um, you're a pretty handy footballer yourself, Steve, but I, I, it's fair to say that your coaching career's probably surpassed the standards you might have yeah. got to as a, as a player. 
and, and look, I know you analysed this stuff, and I'm sure when you were watching that docky, you probably found yourself thinking with a coach's hat on a lot of the time. But mm. um, when when did you realise that you kind of had that mentality and, and just the way of thinking that you might be able to manage people? Did you always know through your playing days or or really was it when you started coaching club footy and then through the ranks that you realised you had a knack for it? Uh, I, I don't know if you ever realise it. I think it's just something that you do because that's how you, you operate. You know, you have a choice uh, in life to go uh, in different directions, but but it's always your choice. And But what gives you the choice is your own experiences. And as a player, you know, I was fortunate to have some wonderful coaches, very, very, very good coaches, but I was also fortunate to have some very poor ones. And out of that, if you're, you know, if you're flexible enough to want to learn, you can learn from them as well as the good ones. And uh, you know, you learn what not to do. Uh, I wasn't a, you know, a great rugby player. I was handy enough to be able to play back in those days provincial rugby, and but you know, I wasn't top drawer. But that was also an advantage to me too, because a lot of the time I was being uh, either dropped or being left out of the squad um, because they couldn't put more people into it and you know they only carried squads back in those days of 21 and I'd always seem to be the 22nd guy so I'd be getting dropped from the A team down to the B team and um, you know I was a really passionate uh, young uh, rugby player I wanted to be an all black you know and, and not having that success of selection uh, knocked you around a lot and you know how you how people dealt with you in those times um, some was some of them were good and, and some were poor but you know, I, I took that with me uh, when I went into coaching. You know, how, how would I want to be treated? How would I want to receive this message of, if I was a player? And a lot of the times, um, you know, you would change how you deliver it. And after a while, you'd develop the habit of, of doing it with empathy and and uh, as best you could and, and as honest as you could because you didn't want to be uh, make around if I was the player Back in my day, I got told, you know, a couple of things that totally weren't the truth. So that stayed with me when I gave messages to players. I wanted them to be able to know that, okay, I might not agree with what Steve's telling me, but at least it's it's how he feels and it's it's um, it's the truth from his point of view. Well, authentic. Authenticity. Um, you've got a very calm, calm demeanour, much like Chris Waller. Have you had any decent blow up either in the changing rooms or maybe the, the lounge where you've missed a three league multi? <laughs> <laughs> I tend to get a lot more emotional uh, in the racing than I do with the footy. Yeah. Um, because you don't have so much control uh, with it. And the other area I probably get a little bit more emotional is around the kids. Um, because, you know, uh, because they are kids and, and you are emotional because there's got a lot invested in it. So they'll tell you I probably don't listen as good to them as I do the rugby boys. But <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, the big difference with the rugby guys are that you, you're in there every day and it's what you do for a job. It's not, yes, you, you're attached to it, but it's not uh, life and death stuff. If you can understand, it's important. Of course it is, you know, and you, 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 what are you doing it for? You're doing it because, you know, you love it. You're doing it because you want to help people be better. Uh, and you're doing it uh, well, then you get the opportunity to win. And, you know, I'm a pretty competitive person. So uh, there's been times when uh, I've let rip uh, in the changing shit, uh, but very rarely because uh, I find that doesn't really solve much. You know, at half time, if you're not going any good, it's about finding solutions as opposed to telling them they're not going any good. You know, these guys are, are pretty smart operators. They know that, that they're making mistakes. They don't need me to tell them. What they need me to do is assist them and and trying to find a way to to, to improve and and uh, you know change the processes that we're doing to get the results we need to get so we can win. We've got a bunch of questions from the community um, and, and a lot uh, kind of more just if we can rip through faster. And there's some, there's some pretty good ones, actually, trying to compare racehorses to players you've coached. So it'll be interesting to see what you have to say about that. Um, but, but, look, I asked Brendan McCullum this, and he had an interesting answer, but that might be more to do with his, I guess, personal ethos. 
the way mm. you've done your your I guess rugby coaching career, can you draw parallels between that and maybe the way that you you operate? when you work with horses as far as owning or breeding or syndicating, do you find like your demeanor and your attitude is kind of pretty steady and, and it goes across a couple of aspects of your life? Yeah, I think so. Look, there's no point, you know, getting all worked up over anything. If you stay calm and, uh, you know, the pilots call, use a term deliberately calm when you're under pressure. So that was something we took into our coaching and, um, trying to stay calm when you're deliberately calm when you're under the most amount of pressure. Um, the thing about horse racing is uh, you can't talk to the animal. You know you can look for the for the signs and and you know if you're working with them every day and and you're good at reading the body language of the animal, uh, like someone like uh, Chris is, and a lot of good trainers will be able to tell you what the horse is feeling and doing just by looking at them. And, and how they go about their everyday life. And it's the same with the players. Like we would, I would spend time uh, every day making making a round, just having a look at the how they were, how their body language was, not so much what they were saying to me or saying to other people, but just watching their body language and, and trying to work on the stuff they weren't saying uh, to get a real um, feel for how they were operating. Now, and, and good Good rugby players are, are, by and large, good athletes. Um, different type of athletes. You, you know, your, your, your quick guys are, are all uh, power and, and your big front rowers are, have got that same power but not in the same quantity and, and in their body shape. So, you know, you look at your big locks, the big, long, lanky, uh, like a stayer, uh, whereas your sprinters, are, you know, got the big backsides and, and are all power. And a little bit fizzy. <laughs> we'll probably just bowls then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Have you got a uh, a good punting yarn for us up the sleeve? Uh, Favorite collection? No, not really, no. no I'll tell you, a great punting yarn is whenever you win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too right. I heard Dad told me a great story about um, uh, uh, dinner Martha. Arthur did him, he's the late Arthur did him, he's now dead. He, he really uh, hooked into the Aussie bookmakers over the years and he went over with a horse. I can't even remember the horse's name. You'd have to talk to Jumbo, his, um, his son, about it. But apparently he went over and he mortgaged the house. Wow. <laughs> and uh, he, um, he put it on and droves and uh, anyway, the horse couldn't get a go. Oh, so he he was on the phone to his wife and he said, "Look, you get a second mortgage." <laughs> so he, had, he he lined him up seven days later and and he got it all back plus some. So wow, yeah, it wouldn't it have encouraged any of that sort of behaviour in twenty twenty, but uh, <laughs> no, no. But he was uh, very very good. The, in the end, I think the Aussie bookmakers were scared of him. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, Sounds about right. Uh, do you ever wonder, uh, we talked a bit earlier about racing and kind of the dire state that it's found itself in. Does it ever, um, I don't know, do you ever ponder where racing went wrong in sense of getting the average sport fan's attention? I feel like, you know, my granddad and my dad's time when they grew up, racing was really a sport. And if you're a sports fan, you're probably a racing fan. And there's a bit of that in Australia still. Actually, there's a lot of it. We saw what Winx did just became a, a story, a news and sports story. Here it's a bit different. Like I've got a lot of mates that love to have a punt on the footy or whatever, but just don't seem to connect with racing. Have you ever thought much about that? Yeah, well, look, I think if you compare Australia with what they do at the event, they, they, they make the racing day a real day out. And young people today, um, they only go to the big cup meeting. You know, New Zealand Cup meeting down here, uh, cup week is massive. With the young people, but we're not capturing them um, for everyday meetings, and and that's because I think a couple of things. One, we don't cater for them, uh, so you've got to cater for them. And secondly, I think we we're not making it exciting enough because you know the bigger the race, it's usually the bigger the stake. And if there's big stakes involved, there's usually great horses involved. So you get a winks. 
where you get, you know, a number of good horses in one race and it, it's it's then exciting and people want to be part of that. Um, so unless we can create an atmosphere where we get our young people going, then, you know, we're just going to have older and older people go and um, unfortunately the industry will slowly die off. Very sober, but sobering, but very real uh, information there. Yeah, and well, I, I don't know. It's e it's easy to talk about it, easy to come up with solutions, but you know, there's definitely you go to Australian racing and there's young people there in droves. Yeah, you're uh, right. Uh, here, it's not the same, and maybe maybe um, we've got too many uh, race tracks and we can't put the money where we need to put it. And we, you know, we're just trying to survive. Uh, again, I think if we can get some help from the government, and they've just done a big survey to say close the tracks, but I don't know how many are closed. Yeah, we love moving slow around uh, around the racing tracks. I think there's a lot of self interest and you know so many layers, which makes it really hard to actually make decisions. Going back to Chris Wall last week said that on race day, Winks he could tell that Winks just knew that it was race day and she was there to perform. At, at all of the athletes you've coached, are they all like that, or some of them you've really got to switch on and get them into game mode, or can you, you've got some of them are just distinctly ready to rumble? Um, the higher you go, the easier it is to deal with them because my, they, they know. Um, the, the biggest problem we would have is complacency, you know, because we won so many times, and unlike a horse, you, you, you know, you don't have that subconscious that takes over and tells you, you know, repeatedly on one side of your shoulder, you know, you can win, you're going to win this game and, and there's not another little man on the other side saying, well, maybe you won't. And that subconscious is, you know, it's, it's your biggest enemy. So um, some guys suffer uh, with that more than others and it's just a matter of making sure that their preparation and their, their week is is religiously the same all the time, whether they're playing a team that's um, we all know we can beat, or or whether it's playing somebody that's going to be a real challenge. And you know, they're probably the best athlete that I've come across that dealing with that every week and turning up to play was was Richie. You know, he 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 had to go into the, a dark, excuse me, a dark place um, most weekends in his position and and you know, do the hard stuff and he turned up every week to do it and uh, he's a little bit similar to Jordan, probably less X factor than Jordan, but he, he such a competitor, wanted to win all the time and, and but wanted to be the best he could possibly be every time he played and he cer certainly never left, you know, one game uh, out there that he didn't uh, give us everything he had. That's so true, and he's he's a freak of a human. I mean, uh, anyone that can fly a helicopter, oh look, I just that goes over my head, Steve. So, Luke, is there anything you from you? Want to you... Your head, would you? No, no, I don't think so. Uh, anything else from you, Luke? Or can we get into some of the the questions that the community's got for Steve and and start to rip into them? Yeah, I've got I've made some notes, mate. I think I'm good. I can start coaching some people now. Let's get into the community <laughs> questions. Yeah, good. Look, uh, lots of you won't be surprised. Lots of people uh, wanted to know what your be your biggest punt was, Steve. Um, but look, more, more for me, this was the my favourite question. Which rugby player would you that you've coached can you compare to Nature Strip? And I reckon I know the answer. Do you want me to tell you who I think it is, or do you want to? Yeah, go yeah, go ahead. Oh, I reckon it's Geordie Barrett, and I, I, I I'll tell you why I think that because I remember you I remember you said at some stage. Before a team selection last year, Jordy just needs to slow down and he just needs to let the game come to him because he's a freak, he's a talent, he's big, he's tall, he can goal kick, he's fast, he probably play lock if he wanted, but he just needs to calm down and have a think sometimes. And I sometimes I feel like that's that's the same story with Nature Strip. When James can really just get a hold of him, pace him into a race and let him do his thing, he's unbeatable. Well, mm. How close am I there? Yeah, well, I think he's a good example. I think um, a younger Damien McKenzie was the same. You know, he was ripped here and bust right from the get-go. Um, but both are very, very good athletes and have got the ability to set the world on fire. So, be, you know, I'm really looking forward to watching Geordie mature over these next few years and play uh, extremely good test footy. One of the lads has asked, where does your work ethic and drive come from? Probably your dad, I'd imagine. 
Uh, from the upbringing, yeah. Um, you know, we, if you come from farming stock, you know that you've got to get out of bed in the morning. doesn't matter what you've done the night before. Cows don't milk themselves. So, uh, you know, I think it, work ethic is um, it's interesting. You know, you get a talented human being and not necessarily do they have a work ethic because they don't need to have one. You know, they're just naturally good. And unless someone teaches them, uh, they'll end up coming to a point in their career where they don't have it and they need it because they're up against other people that are just as talented. Whereas if you find a guy who's not so talented, uh, he he use, and has a real passion and drive and wants to succeed, he'll have a work ethic. Well, I played footy at a low level with uh, both of those people some that worked really hard and then others that were naturally quite talented. And how, do you, how do you teach work ethic? Uh, well, you, you've got to teach them how, you know, how to get out of bed and, and, and want um, what is it you want to achieve. Uh, you do it through a mindset and then uh, show them uh, a skill set that's required to, to go with that mindset and then a, a structure that allows them to practice it and um, catch them out doing it and reward them. But, you know, doing everything for somebody else is not going to let them get a work ethic. Um, patting them on the back all the time because they're a superstar, you know, when they're younger, um, isn't going to give them a work ethic. You've got to teach them that somewhere along the, the way they're going to have to work hard. Now, I don't know if you watched the Jordan thing the other night, but, you know, he had a work ethic. He would do the extra. Now, the top, the top athletes, the top performers, they'll do the extra. They'll still be out there um, when the training's finished. They'll want to, they'll want to do more. They'll be the first ones on the training part. And you know, when you bring young athletes into an environment like that, um, you know, you, you pair them up with role models so uh, that, that they can realize, well, that's what he does, and well, that must be what. I should do. So naturally, they follow that. No, it's, that's very, that's very true, isn't it? And that's not even sport for me. No. That's not even sport um, specific. Like we've all had been in workplaces or environments where that's applicable, and and it's it's so similar to the stuff Chris Waller was saying as well. Just about having to, you know, there has to be that inner drive, and you got to, you know, can't you can't just depend on other people. A good one from the that's just come through in the live stream here. Quick question: Who was the best player that Mr. Hansen has seen play against the All Blacks? Oh, there's been a few. Um, Falau was pretty special. Mm. Um, he, you know, very, very good athlete. Um, South Africa, you know, I think Steph the Toy is probably one of the best players I've seen um, in recent times. England have had numerous very good players, you know. Uh, Johnny Wilkinson was pretty handy. <laughs> he went all right. Mm. Which of the players, if you're allowed to say, um, love talking the horses that, that you've coached? Uh, there's quite a few. Um, there's a few we sly punters too. Uh, you've got to keep an eye on them. Yeah. Geordie uh, Jordy and Albie both like racing. Um, Harley Williams, he, he raced a horse with us for a while. Um, out of horse called First Time, Jimmy Gibbs trained him. And uh, it was his first horse and he won first up, so Ali then thought that's what would happen all the time. So <laughs> It's the worst thing that could happen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, look, I, I think... Most of the boys would generally take an interest in, in something that was going well. You know, like Nature Strip raced, obviously, the day we played Ireland, and uh, the race was on as we went for our walkover. So I had some headphones on, and and uh, I sat up the front of the bus, and everyone knew the race was on because it had been well documented everywhere. And anyway, when he, you know, with 150 go, he still got a bit of a show on, I'm starting to slap the leg a wee bit and get a bit excited without screaming out because there's no one talks on the walkover bus ride and there's no music, there's no nothing. So I've got the 
the um, phone on go uh, Sky Go and um, and uh, Fozzie's sitting beside me and he he's watching and I'm <laughs> I'm going to lay there. Um, you know, and all the boys straight away and when we get off, oh, had to go, had to go, you know. So, uh, uh, I, I guess you know it's a sport that does capture your imagination if you if you've got someone that's got a horse that can go pretty good or you're lucky enough to own one. You never kept picking a bloke because he had some pretty good oil, did you, Steve? No, no. <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't have thought so. Wouldn't. No. I think we want anyone to pick. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure. I'm sure. Hey, I'm sure. Well, you know what the mugs game pumping, do you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I was just yeah, say, I, yeah, sorry, I can't man. even make money on my own horses, let alone uh, on others. But, you know, every, every Saturday I line up to have a go. I think I'm what, what you say there about um, it's a sport that can capture the imagination. I've always said I think racing's got that unfair advantage to be able to do that. Uh, is there a race that, that you can identify that you'd love to win, either as an owner or a breeder? Uh, well, the next one, Nature Strip races in would be good. Everest <laughs> would be handy. But, um, no, well, I think, you know, every race uh, horse owner, or particularly from New Zealand, would like to win a Melbourne Cup. It's, you, know, you can remember, I can remember as a young kid coming home and, wanting to watch it and get home in time to make sure we saw it on the tally. And, um, you know, so it's a pretty special race. Uh, yeah, but look, in my humble opinion, um, every race you, you win as a horse uh, owner is pretty special because there's a, a huge amount of uh, adrenaline goes through the body um, and, you know, in anticipation of, of how your horse is going to go. And it's not not necessarily about how much money they win. It's it's necessarily more around the horse itself and performing uh, the way you know you're anticipating it's going to. That's yeah, that's all right. And look, I haven't owned a horse yet, but I know Luke, you've been involved, and I know many people that do. And that that genuine thrill, no matter what, even seeing a horse run. I mean, you know, yeah. that's that's a it's a special moment. North versus South rugby, um, obviously with all that's going on with COVID. 19 there's a there's a slight chance that this might get off the ground i don't know whether sam whitelock was just talking a bit of junk when he said that the other night but you know it's, there's a chance there who do you reckon would win i know you're a good southern man but there's a lot of talent from that north island uh you would be two good sides it'd be for sure you know um you combine the hurricanes and the crusaders versus uh, sorry the crusaders versus and the hollanders and uh yeah it's a pretty formidable uh, team but saying that you know you've got the three franchises in the north so um be a great opportunity to fuzzy have a trial match anyway what's your favorite sport to watch outside of uh, rugby and racing golf golf any yeah. NRL? Uh, a little bit yeah like i'll, I'll watch any sport if, oh. you know, if i'm allowed to <laughs> any, any NRL players uh, spring to mind that you'd love to see in rugby? Yeah, there's been a few. When yeah. mind, uh, the captain of the Warriors. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, he's a good footballer. Um, no, there's heaps of them. You know, like it, it, any good athlete playing rugby league would, would be a good asset to rugby union and vice versa. Yeah, the young boy from uh, Newcastle is going to be a very good rugby player one day, I think. Yeah, yeah. Caleb, Caleb Pong, yeah, he's, a, he's an absolute freak. I know Bowden Barrett, he's a, I've seen him kick an AFL ball. I heard stories about him kicking an AFL ball, and um, yeah. he went all right. And I can imagine he would have been a hell of a footy player. You, you coached him a lot playing first five and fullback. Did, mm. you ever get a, did you ever manage to get a read on what you thought his best position actually was? Oh, look, oh, he's... He's probably one guy it doesn't matter because he's going to have an influence on the game, particularly the way the All Blacks play. Um, so I guess it's it's what you can put around him in the other position that he doesn't play. Um, people said, you know, when we moved him back to fullback at the World Cup, he wouldn't get a, to touch the ball enough. But he actually touched the ball more times than anyone else in the history of the game at World Rugby. 
wow. uh, World Cup rugby uh, playing fullback. So it, it's how you want to use him and and what you've got to assist with him. Like he's a he's a world class player, um, you know, one of the best players uh, in the world at the moment. Whether you play him at first five or fullback, it doesn't matter. That doesn't change. I'd agree with that. Back to nature strip. Have you guys had any? Uh, some of the other owners in there, I heard that uh, what the ex CEO of Lion might be in the ownership as well. Is that right? Yeah, Peter King. Yeah, Keno. How's yeah. the party go when Nature Strip wins? Oh, well, they're pretty <laughs> good. Yeah, they're very good. The first group won. He won actually. Uh, I was lucky enough with Tash and I went over to Sydney to to watch it, and uh, Keno couldn't come, and neither could uh, Rod Lyons, the manager. So. Um, we, we ended up having getting the trophy, Paddy Harrison and myself and Paddy's uh, young fella and uh, Dash. You know, we had a massive night, um, <laughs> and uh, we were back at the at the uh, hotel, and you know, we were lucky enough to to be involved in um, you know a uh, sponsors evening there, and so the grog was uh, pretty cheap. In fact, it was free. <laughs> And at one point, I think the cut was getting um, carted around the restaurant. Everyone was allowed to have a drink out of it. So, you know, things have got it a little bit out of hand. <laughs> sounds like sounds like you might have needed Patty to lay a bit more carpet the next morning at the hotel. <laughs> yeah, no, well, Patty, I don't think it was in any condition to lay anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's outstanding. Hey, J- James McDonald, a young Kiwi, by the name of J-Mac. He does a lot of the riding on that that horse of yours. Yeah. He's a speaking of freak athletes and a desire to win. Have you ever had much to do with him, or have you ever reached out and, and do, you, do you know much about the kid? Yeah, yeah, I've known him for a long time uh, now, and um, yeah, he, he is a special athlete, isn't he? Mm. Uh, he's making decisions at uh, at full speed, trying to steer big animals around the park, and um, having to make split second. Uh, decision so he's one of the best if not the best uh, at the moment and um, he certainly uh, has found uh, how to uh, push the right buttons on on nature strip um, you know he doesn't he doesn't ask him to do anything early and uh, whenever, whenever he has over raced it's not because J Mac hasn't uh, has pushed the buttons on him it's just because the horse is probably a little fresh and um, you know, it's been interesting because Chris has um, has done some wonderful things with him, and his attitude is that you know, looking from afar, I'm not. I haven't asked him this, so I might be wrong. But the first race is really not not the big one, and he hasn't pushed him too hard to get him ready for that first race. Whereas. Um, Darren Weir, who had him prior to that, um, won with him first up quite a, quite a lot, and I, I think it's just that he may have, you know, done a bit more harder work before that first race. But you know, with with the way Chris is working, you know, that he's winning big races, second start, third start, uh, consistently, and um, he's he's calming him down, and you know, not not pushing him too hard too early to um, get him over excited. One of the lads asked a pretty good question here. Is there, if there was one All Black before your time that you could have coached, who would that be and why? Uh, there's probably two that I can think of straight away. Um, Ian Kirkpatrick and uh, Michael Jones. Uh, both of them were loose forwards. Um, most people uh, know about Michael Jones. He was a freak of an athlete. Uh, had pace, real X factor, uh, uh, tough, um, and he would have suited, you know, the style of game that we wanted to play uh, today, the way we're playing. And I think Kirky's the same. He was a big man, mobile, um, really uh, tough as nails, hard attitude, uh, yet had plenty of X factor, and um, would have suited, you know, our game. There's a, there's a number of guys, though, that would have been great. You know, just limiting it to two is, is not doing justice to so many other people. What, what, what's it like coaching a player of the aura and brand almost of Sonny Williams? He'd have triple X factor. 
Yeah, he did. And what he does, I shouldn't say he's not dead, so he's still with us. Um, you know, he, he's an under, under um, appreciated athlete by a lot of people. Yeah. An unappreciated person, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he does so much for so uh, many uh, underprivileged people that goes unnoticed yet he seemed to be selfish by a lot of people and um you know i, I don't think he's been given a fair rap uh, he's a pretty much a freak of an athlete he's a massive man uh, good pace um you know and, and as a person i think uh, like all of us uh, he gets better and better as he gets older you know as a young person he'd be the first to tell you he's probably a little selfish um, but so was i and, and so were a lot of other people um, Luke, because you thought about yourself, but as as he's matured and got older, he he's um, developed into a wonderful person. No, I completely agree with that appraisal. To be honest, Steve, I think <laughs> yeah, it's actually crazy. To be honest, if you go look back and you Google Sonny but Williams, there's probably more negative stories than there are positive ones, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And you're right, he's essentially a humanitarian. The bloke, he's a, he's an incredible person. Look, we can't take all your time on a Thursday night. We've got to let you get back to the family and lockdown. Any um, parting wisdom for us or anything, any part of the, your, your story and kind of life and racing that, that we missed out on or, or we'd be interested in, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I, the, the thing about racing is, you know, don't, don't do it if you think it's going to make you a fortune. Do it because uh, you're passionate about going to the races or you're passionate about horses or you're passionate about having a good time with your mates, you know, because it's an industry that's um, ideally set up for all of those things. Um, and, and and then when you do have a bit of luck, um, you know, appreciate it for what it is and, and uh, be thankful for it. Uh, and don't forget that, uh, you know, there's some poor buggers loses the race too at the same time as you're winning it so you know don't get over you know don't let your feet leave the the ground so to speak and stay humble but you know like what an industry it's a great industry it's it's got so many great characters It'll be it the horses or be it the people that work in it or be it the punters or um you, know, you could sit down with some of the old timers and and hear some of the stories uh, from the olden days, you know, you would you'd be you'd be happy to sit there all day, wouldn't you? And uh, you know, it's about us younger people, I guess, creating some stories too that that excites other people to get involved in racing. Well, thanks for your time, mate. I'm sure Nature Strip is going to allow you to have plenty more stories and uh, the Harrison's carpet team as well. By the sounds, <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. Well, thank you guys for what you do for racing, and uh, you, you know, you bring it alive. Uh, for the younger people and and creating opportunities for for the, you know these podcasts, um, I've, I've heard you've had some good ones. So um, hopefully this one is okay. Um, oh. Importantly, um, you know, well done on what you're doing. I think it's great, and uh, don't be frightened to take it to the government. Oh, that's that's the stuff, Steve. Thank you so much, mate. Go well, and um, we'll see you down the trap. Some, so we'll be screaming one home together at one day, one day. I'm absolutely certain. Yeah, well, look, every day, every Saturday, we'll be somewhere screaming for one to get. Do you get excited when you, you know, when you look like you're going to win, or do you oh. just stay looking calm? <laughs> no, mate, don't know, mate. There's no calmness here, mate. We haven't uh, learnt that yet. So there's some yeah. horrific footage out there of a few lads going early, and I'm guilty of it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. It's, Funny enough, when Nature won the other day, and uh, I'm in the shorts and uh, the old t shirts, and uh, we'd had a few beers building up to the day. And anyway, I, I couldn't sit down to watch it. I got up and Tash, my wife, she's unbeknown to me, she's filmed it. And I don't know if you, if you know, but we can remember he hit the front there with about 150 to go, and then he, they sort of went off him and, and, um, Went on to the, the field a bit further back, so he wasn't hurt. He was just just in the shot no more. I was that excited. I screamed across the other side of the room and yelled out, "I can't see him! I can't see him! Get him in the shot!" <laughs> 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 oh, 
We need, yeah, a, we need, to, get a, need to get a drone on them for next start to see, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I just need to calm down a bit, probably. That's what I need to do. No, that's not at all. So what do you do with the footage? Should you track it down and delete it, wipe it from... <laughs> no, I'll touch it. So I'll send it to Paddy, but... Um, uh, <laughs> He, he sent something smart back about, oh, I never saw you get that excited at the rugby. And I said, no, I knew what the bloody rugby boys were going to do. <laughs> That's very true, mate. You can't predict mm. a horse. Uh, excellent stuff, Steve. Appreciate it. You too. Thanks for having us. Thanks, awesome. Steve. There we go. What an absolute icon of a man. Wow. Woo! Oh, good. You boys. Oh. Smashed it. Yeah, nice, mate. Well done, Louie. I've got plenty of notes here. Gee, there's a bit there. Cows don't milk themselves. Great takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> very good point about motivating people and I guess just his style of leadership. And you're yeah. so right. I mean, you know it You know it from looking at him. He's such a calm and composed man and you don't go into the half time, half time, the sheds at halftime and spray your team out because it's not going to solve the problems, is it? Just pragmatism. Yeah. Someone's asked, who is the next sexy notch on the BGP podcast belt? Well, we don't know. We've got a few bloody um, swipe rights out there trying to find that, but uh, no no messages back at this stage. So we've got a couple of matches that haven't been reciprocated, but listen, give it time. Well, you know, sometimes you've got to send the first message and then, and then a follow-up. But uh, we were also speaking prior to this about potentially having a, a sponsor. If anyone would love to come on board and sponsor this, that we can look to do it longer term than just the COVID and the lockdown period. So uh, we'd love to see that be someone potentially outside of racing. So you know how to get in touch with us, the movement at boysgetpaid.com or just drop us a line. Uh, we know it's obviously tough times out there at the moment, but if someone was, does want to t- uh, step up and, and take that naming rights, etc., then we'd love to have a chat and further that because we've got plenty more people in the industry that I think we can get through. And I think we're learning so much every time we put one of these together. Completely agree, mate. And if we can make this a bit more sustainable, I think I think the thing, the way to look at this, you know how you, you keep getting those masterclass things promoted on your Facebook? And it's yeah. like, fucking learn the art of negotiating or fucking learn how to go to the moon. You don't Ooh. need to buy one of those to learn how to go to the moon. You just watch a BGP episode with Steve Hansen or Chris Waller and you learn how to milk cows own racehorses and just the, the amount of infinite wisdom so yeah look, we'd love to get someone involved to make it sustainable for us so absolutely ben what was your big takeaway there buddy yeah just going to touch on a comment uh, that's just popped up by chris monahan mog monaghan free smoothies <laughs> mate um is there a redeeming voucher we can use at uh, cali press or what's going on there mate cali <laughs> oh, great podcast boys that's uh, bloody outstanding eh? it's so cool to see um the appreciation as well we bang on about from people back towards what we're doing and just to be able to get you know, time from these people uh, during during this pandemic and and just hear the stories of they, it's just the same as us they love racing for the same reasons we do right 100 percent. i reckon i definitely reckon he would have punted nature strip eh? 100 do you smack in the leg you only start smacking the leg when you get a little bit on you know what i'm saying yeah, oh, yeah. you don't you only try to figure out where the horse has gone and why it's out of picture if you've you know <laughs> yeah. although bearing in mind he does i'm sure he does punch a check when nature strip wins as well um look I, I'm, I'm thinking by the end of this we might have a little montage to put together of people saying congratulations to boys get paid and that's not just us that's the whole community so awesome stuff you know anyone that's watched that come to an event um been in the punters club that's you as well and chris waller and steve hansen say you know, they appreciate what we're doing for the industry. That's you guys. So, um, yeah, look, I'd, I'd make, like to make that really clear. Bloody outstanding. Well, hopefully everyone got a lot out of it, and it's been good to see the engagement coming through as well. And, you know, like we said earlier, it's not just about the racing side of it. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, life lessons that are coming through from these two. So we'll keep trying to flush these people out and take advantage of what is a bit of a, uh, a tough time to, to educate some people and have a bit of fun. Absolutely. I've identified that there's a plethora or a plethora, I'm not sure on that one, uh, of people that we can get on next. You know, you're talking your Hugh Bromans, your Jay Max, your, your, I was thinking in the comments here, your Peter Moody's, um, your Jerry Barrett. I'm sure he's going to be keen to get amongst it. Christian sure. Cullen, I've seen him down at Awapuni punting his face off, mate. Keen. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, the bad boy. 
Yeah, well, there's final. We better get out of here, boys. Not here to listen to you, cocksmacks. Oh, will you tune out whenever the fuck you oh, like? Oh, Jesus! Oh, did you just make simple? Yeah. I was quite enjoying. Just one last anecdote for anyone still listening. Because I know there still will be people. And he's gone now, Steve. That is, so I can say this, oh. and I don't feel like I'm going to get grilled. He uh, did say to me, and if anyone's wondering, this is why. He is a sir. Yes, he got made, he got given a knighthood and the New Year's honours because he's, I don't know, such a fucking legend in general. He did ask to not be called Sir Steve Hansen because he thought it was too over the top. So we weren't just doing it to be rude. We weren't just doing it because we forgot or we didn't know. We did it because the man's so humble and great that he just he didn't want, he just didn't like it. So that, that would be why that is. And it, again, it's just a testament to him. And I'm sure when Chris Waller gets his knighthood, he'll, uh, he'll be the same. Hey, Luke? 180%. As will hopefully Jason Paris, CEO of Vodafone, if anyone knows him. <laughs> he, doesn't, he hasn't replied to my message. We'd love to get him on for a podcast and learn from one of the greatest leaders in the country at the moment. But, uh, hey, look, you know, we'll get on the follow-up. I see I haven't got any text messages. But, uh, righto, boys, we'll leave everyone to it. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. As always, thanks for your comments, engagement, and energy. Feel free to share this. Do whatever you like with it. Um, print it off. Colour it in. There's lots going on. Let's get out of here. Headlights.